Welcome everyone to uh, the third show and tell. I uh, hope everybody got in easily. Uh, it's one of those hard things that if if you're not getting in, um, how do you find out where to go? So I'm going to put in the chat a link you can just send to someone else. That's the discourse uh, link. And it has the passcode Hello, on everybody. it. Uh, can someone put into the chat the, the actual passcode? Uh, we are trying to speed things up a little bit by having some of the discussion on the discourse. Uh, if the presenters could just quickly, when they have some time, introduce themselves on the correct thread. Um, that would allow people to ask some questions even after the presentations or if we're running low on time. Uh, Marco, you want to pass yeah. something on? Okay, so we have, well, welcome. Welcome to the show and tell. Really happy to see you all here from different parts of the world. So I think we can get started. It's all four now. So it's three or four in, in my time zone. So Ricardo, if you want to get started. Hello, my name is Ricardo and I want to show you the project me and Luis are working on, a personal trainer through TinyML. The objective of this project is to find a way to bring TinyML to a gym by identifying when an exercise is being done correctly or not. So we need to create a product that is small in size so that it fits on the side of a dumbbell and won't be in the way when executing an exercise. It also needs to be battery powered and able to communicate using Bluetooth so we can completely evade using cables. But firstly, do you know what is the right way to execute a bicep curl? We bring an example of a simple exercise. This movement is called bicep curl, and there's more than one rule to execute this. But I'm going to show a common mistake during the trains. Here we have two videos showing the bicep curl. If you train like the video on the left, the result won't be positive. So the right way to execute this is like the video on the right side. In this movement, it's needed to keep motionless elbows close to your body while lifting the dumbbells. To do the task we set to resolve, the CD Studio development board was chosen since it fits in all the requirements of the project. It is physically small, has low power consumption, and is capable of recharging the battery when connected to a USB-C has built-in accelerometer and gyroscope, a Bluetooth 5.0 antenna, and a microcontroller that can handle TinyML models. But there is also the need of a way to protect the board and a way to place it correctly on the side of a dumbbell. Making a 3D casing solves this, those two problems. This 3D casing has a central structure that helps in holding the microcontroller in place so that it won't slide to a side or another. It also has a battery compartment in the area below that can be closed by a lid and the whole casing is held in place by screws so that it becomes mechanically robust. This way it is possible to bring the microcontroller inside a gym while having it protected from external factors and providing a way for it to work without cables. So, having the 3D casing in place, and with the setup, we can collect data in a real environment to form a data set. It all starts by sending a command from a smartphone, then the microcontroller starts collecting data from the accelerometer and gyroscope for a total of 12 seconds. It is roughly five or four repetitions of an exercise. During all this time, this data is being sent through Bluetooth to the smartphone that is receiving and storing in either a CSV file or an online Google Sheet if the if internet connection is available to the smartphone. But how exactly is the smartphone sending commands? By using the MIT App Inventor, an Android app was developed to work as a human-machine interface. Establishing and communicating with the microcontroller, it has 
two main functions to be used as a data logger when acquiring data and to be used as the display when receiving inference results. This diagram over here represents better how the inference result will be displayed. By receiving the command, the microcontroller starts analyzing data from the accelerometer and gyroscope. After every repetition of the exercise, it sends a result through Bluetooth to the smartphone that displays on the screen and also plays a sound if either you made the correct or wrong execution of an exercise. Next step is uploading all this collected data to Edge Impulse, where a feature extraction can be made to find the most important values offered by the sensor fusion between the accelerometer and the gyroscope. Then a model development can, can take place, and sometime in the near future, a final product can be achieved. We thank every single one that has helped us in some way up until now, including Supervisor Marcelo Rovai, Supervisor José Alberto, João Vitor, Gabriel Vargas, Pedro Linhares, Rodrigo Pereira, and Clayton Nogueira, the physical education professional that kindly recorded the video shown before. We also thank Seed Studio for providing us the microcontroller used in this project, and CNPQ for sponsoring our ideas. If you have any questions, please ask them, and I will be pleased to answer. Great, oh. great presentation. Super, very, awesome. very interesting. Awesome. Any question for Ricardo? I think Lila has one, uh, Marco, in the, the chat. I cannot see it. Lila, do you want to unmute yourself? Yes, thanks for the presentation. I just want to know if you are using uh, the data of accelerometers or gyroscope or both to have better precision for this thing uh, be between bad position and, and good position of the body. So first, thank you, thank you for the question. Um, at the moment, we don't really know if the accelerometer or the gyroscope is the most important one. So we are using a combination of both when recording the data. Okay, thank you. Laila, only to compliment, uh, this project is not uh, complete yet. They are in the, the phase of uh, collecting data so that, that uh, when, when the they will develop the, the the model so they will analyze the the, the feature or well, what's the best feature to to handle. probably okay. we we'll have part of both <laughs> okay okay because this is one uh, central point in our data so if you should use uh, one of the sensors or combination of both so okay let me know when when you study this point thank you Okay, super. Thank you very much, Ricardo. It was very, very interesting. We can move to Carlos from Haveriana. Um, okay, good morning. My name is Carlos Alberto Rodriguez. I'm from Bogota, Colombia, and I'm a student at Haveriana University. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here sharing my project with you. This project is still in progress, so I'm going to show you the work that I have done. And if you have any suggestion for the ML model, it would be appreciated. Um, the title of my project is Irrigation Prediction for Crops Using Machine Learning at the Edge. And the main goal um, is to reduce water consumption in crops. Uh, to get into context, according to the Food Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, the population will increase to around 9,000 million inhabitants in 2050, and we will need more water to produce 60% of the estimated food. Mm -hmm. One of the problems is that 100% uh, well, of the water on Earth, only 2.5% is fresh water we travel. And from this percentage, 70% is used in the agriculture industry, according to the World Bank numbers. And for these reasons, we should find a way to optimize these renewable resources. 
the goal of organizations like FAO and the World Bank is to encourage farmers to implement solutions or techniques to take care of water, like precision agriculture, water systems, etc. And I want to take approaches to new technologies like machine learning and compare if this could improve the use of resources in agriculture. So I found some preview works and reviews like this, uh, which take advantage of ML and wireless sensor network to increase the automation of tasks and in, in agriculture and improve the geo while optimizing the use of natural resources. But the problem with this solution is that all the process is made on the cloud. And here in Colombia and in many places around the world, uh, the network coverage or quality isn't good um, in, in the countryside. And that is a problem for that kind of solutions. So my approach is to use machine learning in an embedded device to avoid the problem of communication with the cloud. And although this approach also uses uh, an internet connection, it only makes a little request to an API, so no need for high quality network communication. Um, this is the general architecture that I have implemented. Uh, it's an edge computing unit that has, uh, has humidity, temperature, and UV sensors, also a microcontroller, um, cellular module and a cellular valve. I, I divide this project into three stages. So the first one is to build a data set. So the idea is to take data from our web page and edge device sensors, visualize it on a dashboard and feed it into a database. Uh, then I organize, I organize and select relevant data for, for a more ML model. Uh, the second stage is to select an appropriate ML model. And according to our preview search, I figured out that time series models like relevant spectrum machine could be the model to implement. Uh, the support vector machine model could work too. So may I can test both and see which model is the best for, for my application. Uh, the idea is that the inputs of the models are uh, of the model are the data from the sensors and some data from the meteorological web page. And at the output, I will see an estimated of the soil most to trend in the next few hours to decide if I should activate the irrigation process and for how long. Uh, next steps are train, evaluate, and deploy the model. So I plan to use edge inputs if it's possible to work with these models. Uh, if not, I'll have to implement a ML model in another platform, for instance, TensorFlow, for example. Uh, in the third stage, I will test the system with a tiny ML model. So it works by making a request in the API and taking some data, then taking data from the sensors, feeding into the tiny ML model, and the path will act depending on the output uh, of the model. And finally, reporting the result back to the dashboard and feeding it to the, the database for future analysis. Um, on this slide, you can see the environment for testing the system. I plan to power up to power the device to a solar panel system and use two crops. In this case, uh, it will be just two pods, uh, one with a solenoid valve that will activate according to the output of the ML model and the other one according to the soil moisture sensor response. And this is for uh, comparison purposes. Um, this is the work I've done so far. In, in the first image, you can see the edge device. Uh, I developed a shield to assemble the microcontroller, uh, the cellular model, and the connectors for the sensors and valves. Uh, on the right uh, um, is the entry system implemented with its solar panel system and the two pods as trucks. 
uh, these are the dashboards I have implemented. Uh, one for the data sensors is empty because I haven't started taking data. And the second dashboard is for API weather uh, web page. And uh, I'm taking data from the open weather website. Uh, finally, this is how the database looks like uh, with the IP weather data. I can implement it using MySQL. So, thank you for having this show and tell. And I also want to thank Diego Mendez, who is my project manager, uh, who, encouraged, who encouraged me to work with TinyML on this project. Thank you. Super, thank you very much, Carlos. That was extremely interesting. So let's see if there is any question. Marco, I have a question, Alberto. Yes, please. Go ahead. Uh, Marco, I'd like to know what the UV sensor that you used in your project. Okay. Um, I'm going I'm to look uh, for the reference and let, let me... Um, for, um, so in the meantime, where yeah, where you find I, it? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, excuse me. I I am gonna use a ML eighty five eleven sensor. Uh, he who use uh, another um. Uh, and I'll put output. Uh, I'm going to share uh, with you um, the, the sensor. Uh, let me share the screen again. Um, uh, this is the, the, the sensor that I, um, I'm going to use right in the middle. And uh, the reference is UV ML. Eight five one one. So I select this um, this uh, uh, solar uh, UV sensor because uh, it's in the range of the uh, operation that works for 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 the system. Okay, thank you, Mark. Very good. Okay, thanks, Scott. So I have one one quick question, and it's about the communication part. So you said you're using cellular. Is that the only option you're considering? Because cellular yes. tends to be quite power hungry, right? So it, it yes. uses a lot of, yeah. Yeah, um, I consider other kind of communication like, um, I don't think that's um, um, Sigfox, Sigfox communication, but uh, uh, it doesn't um, have a, a big a coverage here in Colombia in some places. Mm -hmm. So that's the problem. Uh, I'm, I'm select a, a cellular module because uh, it's um, more practice to use in, in, in countryside. Okay. Okay. So you, get, you still get mobile coverage even in the countryside. Okay, good. Yeah. Thank you very much, Carlos. That was very interesting. Let me clap the hands here. We now move to Kimberly. Kimberly. Uh, yes, um, my partner uh, is going to present. Okay. Okay, so you can share your screen when you're ready. Okay. Um, good morning, uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, uh, we are biomedical engineers. And we are going to present the, the project Eye to Eye, a non-invasive anemia detector using machine learning. Which is a project uh, is not finished yet uh, with the same fundamentals course in the University of Peruana Cayetano Heredia in Peru. So first of all, we have to talk about the problem background. Anemia is a really big problem to solve. Five million of people in Peru have had anemia in 2021. And the prevalence of anemia in kids is really uh, high. For example, e Peru is fourth globally in prevalence of anemia in children six to 59 months. However, it's not equal everywhere. 
uh, the, in rural areas, the prevalence is more than urban areas, as you can see in the image too, this graphic. So how, how the, why does it happen? So this is because the lack of basic services that rural area has. So what are we proposing? We are proposing a prototype which gives a presumptive diagnosis of anemia in an invasive way using the palpebral conjunctiva. Uh, this is will applicated in the in rural areas where the prevalence is more. So we enumerate the requirements that the prototype have. Uh, we need it to be low maintenance and cost, be totally no invasive using the palpebral conjunctiva. So how does it work? This uh, the prototype will capture the images of the palpebral conjunctiva, then send it to the machine learning. Uh, this compare with another pictures that we extracted of the data bank evaluate them and show us a message if the patient will probably have anemia or won't probably have anemia. We used this, the, these components. Uh, we used the Raspberry Pi 4, a micro CD, which has a memory of 32 gigabytes, an LC touch screen, a webcam, keyboard and mouse, and also HDMI wire. The webcam is really important because we need a high quality image to take better pictures. And also we need a cell phone charger to connect the Raspberry Pi 4 to a source uh, power energy. We translate this, uh, this idea into a 3D model using Autodesk Inventor. We, this is, these are the pictures. And the image file represents the, the basement, the place which has the, the Raspberry Pi and the, LC, and the LCD. And the image 4 represents the, the placement where will be the, the camera to take the pictures. These are these are the components. First, uh, first we connected the webcam and the Raspberry Pi, as you can see, uh, using the using a computer to make the code, uh, make the function. After that, we print the components in a 3D printer, a laser or or using laser cut, and then we put it together uh, to make this uh, our prototype, final prototype. We, uh, I took a picture of me and the prototype to show you how it's bigger. It's not bigger at all. Uh, I forgot it, but the, we use the measurements of a, an adult's face to, to make the dimension of this prototype. Okay, so here you can see the prototype. Beginning with the webcam, which is on the top of it, we also have this yellow part, which is made of plastic in the 3D printer. This can help us to give the patients chains the support needed. And a small piece under this yellow, uh, this yellow one to decrease the chances of breaking up this support. Furthermore, we use the LCD screen to show the results on the presumption of anemia. On the right side, we can, uh, we can see connections arranged. We wanted to add also a lithium battery for the times that we cannot connect the, bright, the, the prototype direct on the plug. Unfortunately, we didn't find a, a good one with good amperage in our country, but with an ideal one, the prototype could function at least 12 hours without being connected to the plug. Uh, I mentioned this because sometimes in the rural parts of our country, um, it is not uh, used to have electricity. So we think this project to be in a hospital. Uh, next, please. Okay, how did we program the software? First of all, we need to find the data bank to use the images. This step was really difficult to overcome because none of us had an IEEE account that, wasn't, uh, that was until one of our teachers uh, lent us his account. Um, so then we could uh, download the images in order to compare the data we are going to upload. Next, we have one of the most important steps in our project. How, um, how machine learning is reflected in the use of teachable machine. Then we translate uh, to the Python code to finally upload to the Raspberry Pi. Next, please. Uh, okay, here, the software teachable machine. Here we have the, uh, the IEEE data we use. I wanted to emphasize here uh, the teachable machine. Initially, we had 120 pictures in the data bank, but this number was too low to have good results. 
we applied a commonly used method, which is consists in half balance uh, between the number of images. For instance, we made 87 pictures of anemia and 131 pictures with no anemia. We just invert the pictures without alternating the part that is going to be analyzed. I mean, the, the part of the eye, the palpebral conjunctive. In the right part, uh, we have the picture of palpebral conjunctive of one of our teammates. It is noticeable that it works really well uh, showing the percentage of anemia. In this case, he doesn't have anemia and the percentage shows 89% of no anemia. Next, please. Uh, now, moving on to the flow chart, as we can see, the patient is going to put the head on the base then we have to focus the palpebral conjunctive in the image. It's clear, um, if the image is clear, uh, there are two results. If it's one, that means that the patient possibly have anemia, possibly because we are talking about a presumption. Otherwise, if the result is zero, that means that the patients may not have anemia. Next, please. And how does it work? We can notice here the correct use of our prototype. One of our uh, team members is showing us how to use it. We can also appreciate on the screen the results. In this case, zero for anemia. And one anemia are for the previous test we, we did that day. Uh, next, please. OK, for our next steps, uh, we want to keep working as a team should do. To increase the number of images, uh, because we, if we have more images, if we have a bank with, I don't know, 1,000 images, it could really be helpful to, to have a, a good result. Um, also, improve the code, because it is not our strong part. We would like to prototype uh, to do more things in the future, such as recognizing if the eye belongs to a man or woman and classify them. Also, we want maybe to send these informations to the doctor to, uh, to give his the record of these results. Uh, also, we can uh, improve the efficiency on the computerized process. It is highly important for us to minimize the possible resources of mistake and decrease their chances to really low ones. Next, please. As you can see here on this presentation, our emails I write them down in case you wanted to contact us. For any questions or ideas, we are open to any kind of commentaries or recommendations. And finally, we would like to thank you uh, we would like to make an honorific mention to our university and to you to give this space to can develop our ideas. Also, our teacher, Alonso, Paulo, and Moises, who encouraged us to keep going through more difficulties and gave us the necessary tools to continue. Thank you very much. So thank you very much. <clears throat> that was very interesting. And any questions from the audience? Oh, Nabil. Nabil yeah, has a question. Yeah. yeah, I'd like to thank the uh, student for this uh, excellent presentation. Yeah, it's a good uh, use case of TinyML. Uh, I have just one question about the, the samples. I mean, the images the, that would consider different type of eyes from different kind of people from regions from Africa, from Asia, from Chinese people, you know, different uh, shape of the eye. So this is something uh, really important in your model. And then how many images you need, because you say that in the future you want to train with the uh, 1000 uh, images. Uh, you need to be sure about the, uh, the number of images that you don't need to exceed because your model can be starting overfitting so that uh, maybe there will be no uh, uh, good accuracy. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, well, in this case, we use uh, the data bank of people uh, which was, which are Italians and Indians. This was the only um, data, data bank that we could find. Actually, we have a surprise because it's not uh, common to have this, this data. Uh, this was one of the just two that we could find. 
but uh, yeah, we search about it and no, it, the ethnicity doesn't matter. Uh, the project just analyzed the color uh, between the, in the palpebral conjunctive. As yes, as you said, we uh, take some measures to try to avoid overfitting and underfitting. Uh, we thought as in the future, we would like to, oh, because this software also um, is like a, hum a human, no? Uh, that when start learning uh, with, a, with few images, then you put more and more and more. And then it's a point that when the software uh, is going to, to stop, to stop to, to, to learn. So we need a, a number exactly. But as I said, we was thinking about uh, 1,000, really. That was like our, our next goal uh, to, to give more, uh, more information and more pictures to the software and see how it works. What uh, about IEEE? You have mentioned IEEE in your presentation, but I didn't get the point. What is the IEEE relationship with the, the project? Oh. Uh, we download the images from this website. We found the data bank here. IEEE Explore, or uh, I mean publications, or, uh, no, or just it, images? Images, images. Uh, yes. It was like, as I said, uh, 120 pictures of the upload. Okay, thank you. Good luck. Uh, Hello guys, uh, I would like to say something. Uh, as part of the Peruvian University, we are working with a hospital to collect more data in order to improve uh, our model. No? As um, Kimberly said, uh, it only was uh, less than 200 pictures. So as you know, it's not enough, but our next step is also to create a pre-model, pre-processing model in order to increase the, the area to for our detection. Thank you for Kimberly um, and his partner for this presentation. Uh, thank you for the audience. I, I have a, one really quick question, uh, Kimberly. Uh, have you thought about uh, developing the application on a mobile phone so that you can you know take a picture of the eye and it will tell you, you know, uh, the result? Yes, we consider it uh, with my partner and my other teammates. We try to prove it. Uh, Ryoshin, uh, uh, you are testive of it. Um, yeah, but we, we was focused on the rural parts of our country. So there, uh, the Wi-Fi connections, the internet, uh, sometimes that setting six exists. So we that's that's why we didn't put on the phone because we need uh, the internet to put it so uh, as this project is thought for a rural parts uh, we didn't put it so we make it uh, uh, more viable uh, i mean that you can translate to one hospital to another one but connecting to the electricity but as i mentioned before if the, if that's an electricity, you can put it a lithium battery, and so it it maybe works like twelve hours without being connected. Okay, super. Um, any other question for the team from Peru? No. Then thank you very much. Great presentation. So. Right, uh, yeah, I think that's good. So good morning, everyone. Uh, greetings upon their timings, uh, according to timings. My name is Akif Halk. We are from Saudi Arabia, King Faisal University. So today we'll be talking about our project. The project is about estimating the shelf life of date palm fruit using tiny ML kit. From this, uh, from this podium, I would like to thank the professors who are working behind the tiny ML and they have donated to us and we were, ha we were really happy to work with this uh, machine. So in my team, I have uh, with me Abdurrahman, we have, then we have Nasser al Mulhim, then we have Abu Wakim, and myself, Akif Haq. We are from the Community Engineering Department. So in this project, we'll be, we, we, we are using uh, the spectral sensors, the Arduino Nano 33 BLE sense, and the Grov multi channel gas sensor. So let, let's talk about the time. This is the main heart of the circuit itself. 
So we all know about this machine and this um, circuit, this micro uh, microcontroller. It's basically Nano 33BLS, and I, I don't need to you know uh, introduce more about this. I think everyone knows about it. So then we have this multi-channel gas sensor. Basically, this is a gas sensor uh, that can you know have four, uh, that can detect four types of uh, gases: uh, carbon dex, carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, ethyl alcohol, and some type of orga organic compounds. So basically, it's connected through the I2C. I2C, uh, inter-integrated circuit for detecting gas concentration. Basically, we have two types of classification with this in the, in the circuit. We'll be further you know, uh, explaining it, inshallah. So this is a spectral sensors. Uh, basically, it, you know, it can detect 400 to 10 nanometers to 945 nanometer with a bandwidth of 920 nanometer and 18 through 18 spectrometer. Yeah, so this classification will be done with a regression. I guess you can see, I think this is... Uh, tool itself, the component, yeah. So developing the edge uh, 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 machine learning application. So basically we have the device, then we'll be having collecting the data, then we'll be designing the, the designing it, the circuit itself, then we'll be testing it and deploying it. Uh, in this phase, in this time, we'll still be, we're running and we're working on the deployment of the project itself, yeah. So this is some of the pictures that we took, you know, we, uh, when we were in our lab. On the left hand side, you can see the circuit, you know, collecting the dates, uh, the gases from the dates itself you know, from the cold storage room. On the right side is a uh, small, you know, a working uh, lab. Collecting data inside the cold storage room. And here we have the collecting outside the cold storage room, where on the right side, we can see here that it's it's a compact uh, box. The sample was containing 20% of uh, carbon dioxide, 10% of oxygen, and 70% of the nitrogen. It was sealed. Uh, gas seal, yeah. So in this uh, in this explorer feature explorer, we can see that uh, there was some uh, um, uh, some the collecting data about it. In the in the in the in the down and down, we can see the red dots. That's the halas. It's a type of the uh, dates. So we have ajwa dates, or date. These are the names of the dates. On the green dotted uh, data, we can see that these these dates, the red one, the green one, and the yellow one, these have some problems in the frequency that they, they're very close in the test, testing thing. So from here, we can see uh, in the raw data of it, okay, summary of it. So if we can, be, if, if we read this data from the 426, uh, 4,265, mm -hmm. so basically if a date gets rotten, our, our, our main topic is how can we, you know, extend or, you know, or, you know, extend the shelf life of a date itself. We know that the date is a seasonal product. So usually in the Muslim re, uh, religion, they they you know consume dates a lot in the the month of Ramadan. Okay, so dates should be you know you know properly quality maintained throughout this uh, throughout the year. From our testing, we can see that in the six hundred, the the less the down ones six thousand two hundred ninety eight, it's the best quality type of date date, uh, date. And whereas in four thousand two hundred sixty five, this is the the components or the quality of date, it's very raw that we need to consume it, consume it as soon as possible to have a fresh and a better quality of a date. So, and this is another 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 date um, testing. Okay, we have this. Yeah. So, what are the challenges that we face? You know, uh, we had some non-seasonal. So, like I mentioned, it's a non-seasonal mm -hmm. uh, uh, date, hence limited samples that are lead let that. That le leads to poor accuracy in classification, data labeling, with experts laboratory tests. These were some, you know, challenges we faced. Samples were recorded basically one to one to three weeks. However, if frequency, if frequency of the sampling is done at higher rate every alternate days, that will help in estimating shelf life in a better condition. And in conclusion, spectral reflect uh, reflectance of 40 samples of one variety of dates were collected at the first week and then the third week from. Uh, from the triad sensor, for like I mentioned before, so regression, like you mentioned, there will be two uh, classification uh, model. Uh, there will be two models, regression and the classification. So the classific classification model is used in the multi-channel gas sensor, whereas in the regression, we'll be using the infrared spectrum itself. So I would like to, th and uh, in case of classification of different varieties of dates, the FI, FI score will be. For the saga, it's the name of a date, and the class is not impressive. The reason, like I mentioned, that the, uh, the, the reason could be the multi-channel gas is detecting the ethyl and the alcohol 
gases which may not be dominant in those varieties. These are in the conclusion what I what we found out, and still we're working on this project. Um, uh, in the end, we'd like to thank for the given opportunity for us, everyone. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? More than welcome to yes. Thank you very much. Very interesting application and project. So let's see if there is any question from the audience. Yeah, I have I have one question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's a good project. Yeah, and uh, especially uh, related to some local uh, staff and also for all uh, uh, Muslim uh, part because dates are highly consumed in uh, in our culture, uh, especially in Ramadan. And yeah, definitely. And in Saudi Arabia, we have one of the best ones in the world. That my question is about uh, the different kind and types that you uh, considered in your in your study. I think that uh, rotab. Uh, are, are different. I mean, it's a premature state of uh, of date, so it's not a, a different type from from my point of view. So by default, rota will be uh, the shelf life will be uh, will be shorter yes. by yes. default. True, 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 true. No doubt on that point. Yeah, no doubt. So uh, yeah, it means actually, that we cannot compare them with the others. I mean, no, we, we did not compare, professor. Let me allow me to answer. We did not compare. So we did two kinds of experiment. One is like we took different varieties like Ajwa and everything. We want to classify what is that self life, what category it belongs to. So this is one thing. Mm -hmm. The second thing is like we found out that in most of the source during the September or October that month when rootab is available, people used to consume that only for one month period, one mm -hmm. or 40 days period. So in which what people have told us, the, this project is mainly done for the store people, superstore people, where they will be having a containers of different varieties of rotab, which one I can put it for the today's sale, so that which is having a good shelf life, which I can retain for say one week later, something like that. So for that, what we have taken, no, we have taken only one variety. So what is that variety we have taken is uh, some variety which is in our KFU research center. Even we didn't get the name of that one, some variety from that one. We got only 40 samples. So what we did was those 40 samples we have divided into semi root of stage, root of stage and fully mature stage like that we have divided. And for that we were doing some experimentation. What is that self life? So in that self life, what we found out was for example, here you see the model classification. Yep. There is something which is having a good shelf life, which can withstand for 15 days. This number is showing 9,438. This what having a good shelf life. Whereas for some other case, it is like 8109. So it is a one week lesser. So you have to consume within a week. There is some other stage which is okay. One more thing called as three classifications we have done. Uh, one is, is the third one? The uh, expected outcome, what is the unit here used uh, in terms of... Uh, the... Yeah, this is the spectral property. See, we have used 18 spectral uh, sensors in which there is, we have, we have taken a feature in such a manner, uh, ultraviolet LED, then uh, white LED, then infrared, visible near in, infrared. So we have summed up all of these three properties. We call it as A to F then G to K, then R to W, like that six, six properties we have combined. And that number is shown here. Whatever mm -hmm. the number you are getting is spectral property number. Mm -hmm. So depending upon the spectral property, you can estimate the self life. That is what the point. This is, you are right. This is for one variety of the date at different stages, root of, besser, and then semi root of. That is one part of the experiment. The other part of the experiment is like, uh, like Abdul Rahman said, it is like finding out the different varieties self life. Still, we are in progress stage. We did not achieve that success rate because the F1 scale for this case is very low because it is very closer. And hence, we don't know where we are missing. The data labeling we are missing or laboratory we have done physiochemical properties, we did not get the results. So we couldn't classify it correctly. Only with the outer appearance, we are taking this, but it is not giving the correct results. That's what we are failing. We try to tweak it, but it's not working. If I go on the one side, the other side, the some other date is misclassified. 
So we stop the experiment here. Still, we are doing. Still, we have some time. These are the project students. They have six months time. So mm -hmm. we figure it out. But regarding the second part, like given a particular variety within that, what is the shelf life between the different things within 40 days that we have achieved? That we have got around 99%, 100% accuracy in regression model. Whereas mm -hmm. in classification model, still we are struggling because of varieties of reason, less sample. The second mm -hmm. thing is incorrect labeling and we are missing some kind of analysis. I don't know. Uh, in your model, do you give uh, uh, as an input the type of date or uh, your your data set? Yeah, type of, yeah, the first case we are giving as a type of date. For this case, we are giving the type. Label it as a different types of dates. I mean, I mean, in the testing phase, in the testing phase, yeah, the model can detect the the type of date or yes, sir, yes, sir. It it was, yeah, that's what multi-channel gas sensor for classification model. We have used multi-channel gas sensor. Okay. So from the multi-channel gas sensor, once again, I'll be getting three component like GM102, GM302, 502, and 702. It is nothing but carbon monoxide composition, nitrous oxide composition, volatile organic component, and ethyl alcohol component. So that number as a cumulative is given as a feature to all this variety in which it is closely taking both this variety, Kalas and Hilali as the same region, and hence the F1 score is 50-50%. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it is misclassified. So we were unable to get a conclusive result on that one. Still, we are working on that one. This Thank is using you. multi-channel gas sensor. The second variety, what I was telling is, this was used a triad spectral sensor, which has got a 18 spectrum band. So from that ultraviolet, white LED visible, and also with the near infrared, all these things we summed up. And this feature is doing, and regression model is doing fine. We can estimate correctly within one week you have to consume, within two weeks you have to consume like that. We are getting in some number. This number is a cumulative of all the bands. Thank you. Good luck. Very interesting. Any any other question to our colleagues? Well, I have a very quick one. So are you planning to go in, into like a commercial product for this? Yes, sir, really. That's what, uh, Professor Marco Gendro, that's what we are working. We have got a great store called as an Alvothang and Alhafiz. These storekeepers, they are going to give this device with a Bluetooth app so that they will scan this particular device and immediately they can come to know, okay, this one I can put it for sale today. This one I can reserve for one week so that I can capitalize on the demand or whatever it may be. We are working on a product. Excellent. Excellent. So we want to have some shares in your company. It's really, really a cool application. <laughs> Thanks for your really time. Nice <laughs> really nice. One. Okay. Any other question, Jeremy? No, that's uh, there have been some really good projects this year. That's, uh, yeah. Excellent. Okay. So if Dr. Bala is not online, I sent him a message in the chat, but. I didn't get any reply. Then I think we're done with the presentation today. Yeah, so, we can, yeah. We can so go we to the, uh, general questions. Yeah, um, any general question. That's a good point. Anybody, any questions about all the, uh, any of the presentations or, um, yeah. Um, yes, yeah, yeah. sorry. Um, my partner have a question for uh, Laila because I we wanted to to she can explain better uh, her question, please. Yes, Kimberly, I'm here. Um, I was wondering if you try to add some noise uh, at the images you already have because when you have uh, images, but uh, the number of images you have is not enough for the model, you can do some data augmentation in deep learning. Uh, and the point is uh, to add some kind of nodes uh, of noise. Maybe you can rotate the images or uh, do something like that. So the model has um, more data to analyze. And I was wondering if you tried to do something like that. Uh, hi, Laila. Um, yeah, we rotated the, the images. We didn't use the noise. Uh, we expected that the camera have, have hasn't too much noise. However, 
and that that's not the the, the idea. So uh, we we have we have to add noise. However, however, the we however we just, um, we we rotate the images. Also, we add uh, different colors the, of the paper conjunctiva, but the noise we still use it. Okay, maybe I can uh, share with you some information about data augmentation and we can talk about that. I think uh, it, it can be uh, useful for your model. Okay, okay, it's okay. Thank you. Marcelo, do you want to add anything? Yes, I, I would like, uh, regarding this project that, that Fabio was, was talking, uh, I didn't. I, I mean, I would like to know his their experience with Teachable Machine was was surprise for me. Usually, it's 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 good for simple exercises in Teachable Machine, but I didn't see it in uh, in a real project. I would like to to know more about their experience and how and why they use that and not a, a normal way to develop a deep learning project with the image. Kimberly well, or Fabio. Ah, okay. The teachable machine are, are better. We are using with Python. With a, uh, we are making a, co a Python code, and it's really difficult because we are not uh, with the knowledge necessary. Uh, we are still uh, students, so we need to uh, um, learn more about the the, the, mach the machine learning a uh, teachable machine uh, to to improve our project. But however, it's difficult, but it's not impossible. But why why you decide to use teachable machine and not not to use the normal normal TensorFlow tools or Edge Impulse or other 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 tools? Well, we we see that, that we connected better with Python and the and the teacher recommend us the the the, the teachable machine is it's good. Uh, I don't know how to explain it, but. The, the main idea is that uh, it's better with the project that we are using, the, okay. the, the emphasize that we are. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thanks. Also, we, sorry, we use a Python because it's, the, it's better to connect to the um, Raspberry Pi. It's easier for us because uh, honestly, we're, uh, as I said in the presentation, uh, uh, the codes or programming are not our strong part. So it was easier for us to do this. Okay, perfect. <laughs> but as a suggestion, try to use, for example, normal programming with a TensorFlow, convert to TensorFlow Lite. And TensorFlow Lite is very easy to, to download to, to the Raspberry Pi. I think it's, a, it's it for me, seems more easier to do that instead of a teachable machine, at least based on my experience. Okay, we will be very thankful if you can send uh, some information about TensorFlow. We were really happy to see it. Yes, you can do that. I can do that. Super. I, ju I just added in the chat a link to a way to add the results from Teachable Machine on an Android phone. So that is something that I used in a workshop last year, and it works quite well. So the point is, if you want to stick to that, or if you already have some results, then you can... Uh, maybe give it a try. And yeah. Any other comments? Maybe I can, I can just add one word saying that we're going to run a workshop on TinyML, a virtual one, so an online one in April. So I will share the link uh, on the mailing list. So if you're interested in joining that and if you want to get some kind of extra training, and some hands-on experience as well. You're very welcome to to join that workshop in April. And if there's no more comments or no more comments from the audience, if Jeremy, if you want to add something, or we can meet for the next show and tell in one month's time, right? Yep, one month till the next uh, show and tell. And uh, on the discourse, we should be updating on um, people who can present. Hopefully, Dr. Bala can present uh, on the next one. 
Um, yeah, I, I think we're done. Excellent presentations by everyone. Thank you so much, presenters. Uh, any final things, uh, Brian, Marcelo, VJ? No. Congratulations to everyone. Really, really great projects. And it's nice to see that people are trying. All, the, all projects present today, people are doing 3D devices and, mm -hmm. and trying to go to a final project, <clears throat> a final product with at least, at least a prototype. I think this is very interesting. It's very, very, very nice to see. Yeah. Yeah, I, I noticed that, that not everybody's doing exactly the same thing, the exact same microcontrollers. People are solving problems in their own ways and making cases for things, and it's excellent. Yeah. Very good point. Sorry. If you, if you think about it, we saw four presentations today. We have different types of microprocessors. We have different types of sensors being used to the, to the projects, different ways to, to make the development. So it was was very interesting today. <laughs> yeah. Okay, super. We're done. So see you for the next Chantel in one month.